Human-powered traveling. Who still travels like this these days? Many of us, we just book a flight and we're at our destination. No planes, no cars. This guy travels to the highest peaks of the world using only his body power. Jelle is a physiotherapist and an adventurer. He is the first human ever trying to reach the seven summits on human power. And for this, he will row more than 15,000 kilometers. I rode from Java to Papua, that was about 4,000 km of rowing, it took me 6 months and the preparation was as well 6 months or more. The biggest difficulty there was that nobody ever did that. It wasn't that uh, easy to just like say, oh yeah, let's row. At first I thought to do that, but <laughs> luckily I, I changed my mind. But it's important to understand the bigger image of his adventures, so what is his goal? Yeah, I'm going to every continent and I want to climb the highest mountain on this continent. But I go there human powered, so that means that I don't use any engine. And it's not about climbing the mountain or it's not about being on the summit of it. It's mainly because of getting there. If they would bring me by helicopter to the summit of this mountain, I will not appreciate the moment of standing there that much. And that's, that's how I get there. That's for me very important. When there's land, I cycle most of the time or I walk. And when there's sea or rivers, I cross them by rowboat or kayak. Yeah, this doesn't sound like an everyday trip. So why should I travel like this and why should you? First of all, I would tell you, it's gonna be hard, but it's gonna be totally worth it. The things you see, you experience there, it's gonna be hard at first, but after a while you're gonna say like, damn, this is amazing. I've been to islands where nobody lives and you sleep there. And that means you get a very special opportunity to be visiting places that maybe just a few people or from all the world have visited. What a motivational speech. Wow. But still, it sounds so difficult. How did he manage to travel such a big distance with a rowing boat? It, it mainly was island hopping. So you just go from island to island, you follow the coastline. I think the biggest crossing I did was 120 km, was 35 hours of rowing. But that's not stop, you just don't sleep. <laughs> so you're probably curious now. Generally speaking, where did he sleep? I mainly slept on the beaches of the island. And that took a lot of preparation on Google Earth actually. Just because of the satellite images, I could see where there was some beach. On others I could see maybe there's some rock and then it gives some opportunities to say oh yeah I can go to this beach because it's probably sand and when you're there you can still look if it's sand or not and then you know you can sleep there. So if it's stones you cannot sleep there? So when there's rocks, especially when there's big waves coming in, then we just don't go. Alright, so he mainly slept on islands, but where did he find food? On the satellite I just zoomed in so much to see if there would be houses on every small island. And then I knew there I will be able to find food. So I always had food for me for, let's say, five to six days. I could survive food and water. Like next year, I will cross the ocean from Portugal to Miami by rowboat. It's about two months on the ocean. And then you just have uh, the freeze dried food. So it's just the bags with some dust and you, you pour some hot water and you have a spaghetti. And you try to catch some fish once in a while. You just throw out a hook and you hope some fish takes it. But that's it. Jelle also shared some tips and tricks to have an optimal travel experience. Preparation is the most important thing. Always look at the weather. If you're in doubt to go on the water, don't go. Because it means that there's something wrong probably. And don't take the risk because the ocean, it can be extremely unforgiving. If you stop rowing, you go somewhere else and you don't know where you're going because the sea is always moving. When you're close to land, you're more in danger than being out of the open ocean. Because there's wave crashing onto the land. There can be some rocks, very big currents. And I have a friend who was in the military once and he always told me you can never have too many socks with you. And I totally agree. <laughs> it can make a really big difference because you need your feet to move. Another thing is what I love to do and I think it's very important as well is try to learn some local language because immediately people appreciate your doing effort and you create a much better connection to those people. And to be very concrete, this is everything that Jelle carried with him on his rowing boats. So for, for my boat from Java to Papua, I had like hammocks with mosquito nets. There was a big box that was waterproof, things to repair the boat, a cooking stove, 
some cooking pots, some spare clothes, camera, you have a compass, you have your paper maps, uh, you have the nautical maps. You need some pilot books, it, it means that there's some tables in there, how the tides are gonna be, how the currents are gonna be. I used the navigation as well, and then uh, safety equipment, so life jackets, GPS, like I think I had three devices for my safety like the satellite tracker then it's like a kind of an e-perp that's similar and then as well the radio to be able to contact other boats and ships and then to charge all these things i i had a solar panel with me it's actually basically let's say things to sleep to eat and then safety equipment and a medical kit i'm also very interested in the financial aspect of such trips so i asked him how much did it cost to travel from java to papua with the rowing boats the biggest expense to bring the boats from belgium to indonesia that was a shipment oh, it's maybe 10,000 euros to ship the boat to there and back once you have your equipment there it costed me less than seven euros a day when i was in indonesia just because you always sleep on an island and you just have some local food so you you never spend a lot of money then I know this is a lot of information, but if you want to challenge yourself a bit further, Jelle has something for you. For example, if you live in Belgium, you can always cross the English Channel. That's a, a really good challenge. That's about uh, 12 hours of rowing, I think. And that's already a good idea to know how things go. I feel like there's so much yet to be discovered and limitless opportunities to go on a human-powered adventure. I'd also like to know who is watching this video. Are you a rower yourself or are you just very interested in the subject? Did you find inspiration by listening to Yala's story? Let us know in the comments below. But before you click away, leave me a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thank you, thank you so much and see you in the next one.